Welcome to Fudge Muppet, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Scott, and today I have to say that one of my greatest interests is mythology, or rather theology, depending on your religious persuasion or absence of such. And the Elder Scrolls universe is rich with it. Many gods and multiple cultural interpretations and various versions of a monomyth that all inform Tamriel's culture on how to think, how to behave, and what to aim for in life. Elder Scrolls lore is rich with myth and legend, but it's as rich as it is vast, and sometimes it's easy to lose track of things. So welcome to our new series, which will break down the dominant faiths of each of the races, as well as the various heresies and antecedents that may still linger among them. Do be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you do know when we have dropped a new video. And with all that said, welcome to the first of this new series, The Ultima Gods Explained. The Ultima, the tall, long-lived race of golden-skinned elves who claim descendants from the gods. They consider themselves the greatest of all the races, believing they are like the ancient Ultima, elves unaltered from the divine image of Auriel, and they often think of themselves as the forerunners of civilized culture on Tamriel, which is not entirely untrue, yet I fear this trail of thought tends to neglect the valuable contributions of other societies, and because of this proud and snobbish attitude, they have garnered a certain reputation with the rest of Tamriel's peoples. Colloquially, they are known as the High Elves for both their obvious physical height, but also the height of their culture and perhaps even the high opinion of themselves. So where does this belief come from? What are the core elements of their culture that have been instructed by means of their religion? Well, ladies and gentlemen, let's start from a place that seems fitting, the creation story. Let's see what the Ultima believe happened at the beginning. First, there was the interplay of the two fundamental forces of the Orbis, the universe. These were Anu, which embodies order and stasis, and Padme, which embodies chaos and change. Yet it is Anuiel and Sithis who spawn from them that truly begin the creation of all, from the monomyth. Anu encompassed and encompasses all things, so that he might know himself he created Anoyel, his soul, into the soul of all things. Anoyel, as all souls, was given to self-reflection, and for this he needed to differentiate between his forms, attributes, and intellects. Thus was born Sithis, who was the sum of all limitations Anoyel would utilize to ponder himself. Anoyel was the soul of all things, therefore became many things, and this interplay was and is the Orbis. At first, the Orbis was turbulent and confusing, as Anuiel's ruminations went on without design. Aspects of the Orbis then asked for a schedule to follow, or procedures whereby they might enjoy themselves a little longer, outside of perfect knowledge. So that he might know himself in this way too, Anu created Auriel, the soul of his soul. Auriel bled through the Orbis as a new force, called Time. With time, various aspects of the Orbis began to understand their natures and limitations. They took names, like Magnus, or Mara, or Zen. One of these, Lorcan, was more of a limit than a nature, so he could never last long anywhere. As he entered every aspect of Anoyel, Lorcan would plant an idea that was almost wholly based on limitation. He outlined a plan to create a soul for the Orbis, a place where the aspects of aspects might even be allowed to self-reflect. He gained many followers. Even Auriel, when told he would become king of the New World, agreed to help Lorcan. So they created the Mundus, where their own aspects might live, and became the Et Arda. But this was a trick, as Lorcan knew. This world contained more limitations than not, and was therefore hardly a thing of Anu at all. Mundus was the house of Sithis. As their aspects began to die off, many of the Et Arda vanished completely. Some escaped, like Magnus, and that is why there are no limitations to magic. Others, like Ifri, transformed themselves into the Elnafe, the Earth Bones, so that the world might not die. Some had to marry and make children just to last. Each generation was weaker than the last, and soon there were the Oldma. Darkness caved in. Lorcan made armies out of the weakest souls and named them men, and they brought Sithis into every quarter. Auriel pleaded with Anu to take them back, but he had already filled their places with something else. 
but his soul was gentler, and granted Auriel his bow and shield so that he might save the Oldmer from the hordes of men. Some had already fallen, like the Kaima, who listened to Tainted at Arda, and others, like the Bosma, had soiled time's line by taking mannish wives. Auriel could not save Altmora, the Elderwood, and it was lost to men. They were chased south and east to Old Elnafe, and Lorcan was close behind. He shattered that land into many. Finally, Trinamac, Auriel's greatest knight, knocked Lorcan down in front of his army and reached in with more than hands to take his heart. He was undone. The men dragged Lorcan's body away and swore blood vengeance on the heirs of Auriel for all time. But when Trinamac and Auriel tried to destroy the heart of Lorcan, it laughed at them. It said, this heart is the heart of the world, for one was made to satisfy the other. So Auriel fastened the thing to an arrow and let it fly long into the sea, where no aspect of the new world may ever find it. This is how the Ultima Believe creation happened, and from this story, we can break down some very core beliefs among the Ultima culture, which the Ultima claimed to have inherited in its purest state. Firstly, there is the idea that the creation of Mundus was a bad thing. It was a scheme by Lorcan the Trickster who sought to place limitations on the ineffable light that was. The Et Arda who were tricked and took part in creation, yet remained powerful still, would be known as the Aedra, and in the Old Mary language, this term means our ancestors. And this is important because it provides a great distinction between the typical beliefs of man and elf. You see, generally, elves believe that they are descended from the gods, whereas men typically believe they were created by the gods. And it's this distinction that colors the underlying philosophies of their beliefs. Put simply, where men tend to thank their creators and are happy to have been born, the elves only see mortality as a limitation cruelly set upon them by Lorca. And this is where we get ideas about the Thalmor secretly desiring to unmake the world so that they may return to life as spirits in Aetherius, untainted by the limitations of mortality. Before we move further, it may be helpful to let you know of two terms that are generally used to describe this dichotomy. Anuic, derived from Anu, is a word used to describe the beliefs of those who have an unfavorable view of creation, such as the Ultima do. Generally within these Anuic beliefs, Lorcan, or whatever name the same entity may go by, is seen as a devious figure. Padamaic, derived from Padame, is a word used to describe the beliefs of those who have a favorable view of creation, such as men generally do, and Padamaic belief tends to place Lorcan as their champion figure, such as the Nordic Shaw or Cyrodiilic Shazar. You could also choose to view Anuic and Padamaic as the desire for either the infinite or the desire for limitation, hence immortal versus mortal. Now, the Ultima lie very firmly within the Anuic tradition. It is Lorcan that they scorn as a devil-like figure, and if you asked them, to return to the ineffable light of Auriel would be their desired goal. Instead, due to their mortal trappings, the High Elves have since resorted to what preservation they can, in lineage, in culture, in tradition, they claim purity and divine descent. They are a highly ordered society, and with such a mindset, it's no wonder that eugenic practices play a part as they try to preserve what they consider the greater bloodlines. You see, it's important to recognize that Ultima religion fundamentally places them above other races in their doctrine. The Aedra are their ancestors, according to them, and the closer you can be to the gods, the purer you are. In the Monomyth, you can see how they tout men as the weakest of souls, and that even the Bosma are tainted to them. Dunmer are often said to be the most xenophobic of all the races, and this may well be true, but I would most definitely place the Ultima as a close second, and I'm sure some could argue they would tie first. But let us now break down the Pantheon itself, and talk more in depth about the gods that they directly worship. Now, it's important to remember that the way Ultima worship is fundamentally different to what you would see in the Imperial Cult, for example. The Ultima are worshipping their ancestors rather than their creators. Ultima society is fundamentally built around ancestor worship, just like the Dunmer I mentioned. In fact, the greatest schism between the people of Somerset occurred in the Morethic era as culture evolved. You see, it had become trendy to worship only the greatest of spirits in Somerset, which would eventually be narrowed down to the Pantheon 
pagan they worship. Whereas the prophet Veloth and his followers despised this new trend and the Velothi exodus occurred. Now of course this exodus had a lot to do with the Daedra and such as well, but we'll get to that in the Dunmer episode. I just want it to be noted that the Dunmer worship all of their ancestors like the early Oldmer did, hence why today they are such a clannish people and value family highly. The third pocket guide to the empire has this to say about early Oldmer society on Somerset. Early Oldmer society was agricultural and politically egalitarian. A system of ancestor worship had been exported whole from Eldmeris, and it brought with it a communal spirit that served the early settlers of Somerset well. When the Oldmer came together as a people to create the Crystal Tower, it was not a monument to any king or god, but rather to the spirit of the elven people, living and dead. Within the glittering walls of the tower are housed the graves of the early Aldmeri settlers, preserved forever as a lasting symbol of the power of the people for that brief moment in history, fully unified. Gradually, as the society grew, social stratification increased. A hierarchy of classes began to form, which is still largely enforced in Somerset to this day. The religion of the people also changed because of this change in society. No longer did the Oldmer worship their own ancestors, but the ancestors of their betters. Oriel, Trinimac, Cirabane, and Finaster are among the many ancestor spirits who became gods. A group of elders rebelled against this trend, calling themselves the Sigics, the keepers of the old ways of Eldmeris. With their mystical powers, they were able to settle in Arteum, away from what they considered the corruption of their society. They continued to return to the land to act as advisors, but never again would they call Somerset home. We can touch on the Sigic monks later in the video, but we now understand how and why these certain ancestors are worshipped as gods, so let's discuss these beings that form the pantheon of the Ultima. The hand of Auriel is always on our shoulder, guiding us through life and protecting us from harm. As you could have probably guessed from the creation story, Auriel is the most important god in Altmeri theology. Auriel is the soul of Anuel, who is in turn the soul of Anu, the everything. King of the Oldmar, time god, honorable spirit betrayed by the vile Lorcan. In Auriel's only known moment of weakness, he agreed to take part in the creation of the mortal plane, for he was told he would be king of it all. But forever they were sons from the eternal Aetherius, and for this betrayal, Auriel led the original Oldma, the first elves, against the armies of Lorcan, or Shore as men named him. With his loyal knight Trinimac, they vanquished the tyrant Lorcan in the mythic times and founded the great kingdom of Eldmeris, also called Old Elnafe, the lost home of the Oldma people. So clearly Auriel is the chief deity of the Altmeri pantheon, and he is envisioned and depicted most as an elf, a crowned elf, holding the sun in his hands. Remember the sun is a giant hole in the fabric of Mundus made by Magnus as he left the mortal realm early, and hence it is a giant hole to Aetherius where Magicka leaks through. So the symbolic nature of Auriel holding the sun, a looking glass into the divine ineffable light of Anoel, is rather clear. There are secondary depictions of Auriel associating him with eagles and wings, and you can see this in the sigils of the Old Mary Dominion and also their armor designs, but the eagle symbology connected with Auriel was most prominent among the Aelids who left to Cyrodiil. There is another more prominent symbol related to this divine, and that is Auriel's bow, a weapon made for him as a gift from Anoel or Anu, along with Auriel's shield to be used in the battle against Lorcan at the dawn. Auriel's bow draws its power from Aetherius itself, channeling it from the sun, hence tying it to the other of Auriel's important symbols. It is an incredibly powerful artifact, taking the shape of a modest moonstone bow of elven design, and according to legend, it was this very bow that was used to shoot Lorcan's indestructible heart into the sea, where Red Mountain and the Isle of Vardenfell would one day form. Now, it is said that Auriel, for all his great feats during the Dawn War against Lorcan, he quote, then ascended to heaven in full observance of his followers so that they might learn the steps needed to escape the mortal plane. Auriel is the epitome of Altmeri ideals, an ancestor king so great that he ascended and returned to Aetherius. And it is this path of ascendancy to godhood, modeled for all those who follow his ways, that has led other gods of their pantheon to do the same. But now let us discuss more of the gods, starting with one of their most powerful. 
The arm of Trinimac bears arms against our enemies, shielding us in our darkest hour. Trinimac is touted as one of the most powerful gods. He was the Knight of Auriel and led the armies of elves against Lorcan and his barbaric tribes of man as he wielded his legendary blade, Penitent, the Blade of Courage. It was he who bested Lorcan in battle and tore his very heart from his chest before Auriel would send it far with his bow. As you can imagine, being considered both Auriel's champion and the strongest of all the Etarda, then one can see why that in certain places, his popularity even outshines that of Auriel. Especially important was his rhetoric. Trinimac had a particular hatred of his foe Lorcan, and he was responsible for spreading the version of events that tout Lorcan as the devil, and he believed, quote, tears were the best response to the sundering, which means that he thought mourning their loss of Aetherius was the appropriate reaction, and it was these views that he spread that would catch him the ire of the Daedric Prince Boethia. Boethia, through the Prophet Veloth, had gained many followers and coloured their minds with Padmaic philosophies. The Chima, as they would be known, sought to leave Somerset and find themselves a new home, and it was Trinimac and his followers that tried to stop them and return them to the fold. What followed has various versions of events, but in summary, Boethia through deceptive means, and in some stories with the assistance of Mephala, defeated Trinimac, consumed him, and spoke in his voice, calling his false narratives into question. When Boethia relieved himself of Trinimac, all that was left was Malakath, the bitterness, the scorn, and the shame. It is this tragic story of Trinimac's demise that is used by the Ultima to portray the dangers of Dunmeri influence. The Eye of Magnus is always upon us in the spells and enchantments that devout mages conjure. Now, for such a magically inclined race, you may expect to find some gods who embody such abilities, and there are a few, but one of the most important, of course, in the Ultimary Pantheon would be Magnus, the architect who fled with the Magna Gi, his followers, before it was too late, tearing holes to Aetherius that exist today as the sun and stars, where Magicka itself flows from. You may of course know of him for his powerful artifacts such as the Eye of Magnus or the Staff of Magnus, and it is interesting to note that he is said to embody powerful mages and lend them his power, though this remains a note of Cyrodiilic legend. The bones of Ifri surround us, giving us food, shelter, warmth, and companionship. Ifri the storyteller, the singer, god of song and forest, is an incredibly important deity to the Bosma, yet remains a fundamental component of the Altmeri pantheon. To the Ultima, he is a forest god, yet encompasses more of the natural world than just that. It is said that it was he who sacrificed himself to become the first of the earth bones and help form the rules and principles of all nature and life on Nern, so the Elnafe would have a home in which to thrive. We will speak of him far more in the episodes regarding the Bosma and Khajiit pantheons, as he plays a far larger role there. But just know that to the Ultima, he is the embodiment of the natural world, and he sacrificed himself to form all natural laws. The mouth of Xarxes whispers in our ear, encouraging us to always learn, always seek, and always discover. Xarxes is the Ageless One, the one who watches, Altmeri God of secrets and hidden knowledge. In the dawn, he was the scribe of Auriel, who kept track of all Altmeri accomplishments since the beginning of time. This god cherished the time of Auriel and dutifully remembered every moment of it and had it committed to paper. Even his very own wife, Ogma, he made from his favorite moments in history. That name may sound familiar to you, Ogma, as in the Ogma Infinium. Well, it's actually said that Hermaeus Mora gave Xarxes great knowledge, and that knowledge was recorded in the pages of that powerful tome. It's also worth noting that there is another tale of Xarxes that claims he was a Merethic Old Mary priest of Auriel who was elevated to divinity by the High Aditi, which of course is quite consistent with the idea that the High Elves are descendants of the Aedra, able to, in miraculous circumstance, reascend to godly status. 
But what is most important about Xarxes to the Ultima is how his principles have informed their societal structure. Ultima society is the most orderly and structured society in all of Tamriel, and this is due to the will of Xarxes himself. He records not just the life stories of individual elves, but all of the connections of lineage and inheritance that bind them together and link them to their ancestors. As nothing is more important to an Ultima than his or her ancestry, it's easy to understand Xarxes' paramount role in defining and maintaining status and stability in Somerset society. It would be fair to say that the stratified caste system and complex customs of the Ultima is the embodiment of Xarxes' values. The heart of Mara beats beneath the breast of every Mer, connecting us by blood and spirit. Mara is a goddess found in nearly every faith across Tamriel, and to the Ultima she is the wife of Auriel, and hence why she is often by extension associated with the female principle of the cosmos that gave birth to creation, also called Ner. She embodies the traditions of marriage and sacred union, and to the Ultima one could argue that she is coloured less so with the wiles of love and connected hearts, but rather with stronger facets of tradition and unity. Modelled as the perfect wife to a perfect god, that god being Auriel. The structured nature of Ultimary society does not lean itself to marriages of love, but rather of responsibility and duty to their society and bloodline. In Ultimary Pantheon, we also find reverence of Stendar, god of compassion and righteous rule, considered in early Ultimary legends to be the apologist of men. Through Stendar, the Ultima exercise compassion for what they consider their lesser, lest they turn to the cruelties that the Aelids unleashed upon the Nedic tribes of Cyrodiil. I feel like Stendar is a very important figure in their pantheon, though I imagine less popular because he provides temperance to the elitist views that pervade Ultimary society and bring weight to the responsibility of being better. As a wise man said, with great power comes great responsibility. We have previously mentioned this idea that exists in the society of Somerset, the apotheosis of elves through great feats, following in Auriel's footsteps. Well, there are some younger ancestor gods that have achieved such ascension through great deeds. Cirabane, a god of magic, sometimes called the Warlock's God or Apprentice's God, is a favoured deity of young mages and his feats once saved many upon Tamriel. In the year 2260 of the First Era, the Slowed unleashed an artificial disease upon Tamriel called the Thracian Plague. It is estimated that half of the continent's entire population was taken by this foul plague and for it the Colovian King of Anvil, Bendu Olo, created the All Flags navy and invaded Thras. Cirabane aided Bendu Olo in his fight, and also through judicious use of his magical ring, he saved many from the deathly fate of the plague. He is also known as the youngest of the Ultimary Gods, and his statue stands on the coastal cliff of Arteum, which he supposedly posed for in person. Now, while not part of the core pantheon as stated in the book's Varieties of Faith in Tamriel, there is another of the Ultima's great ancestors who is worshipped as a hero god, and that is Finaster, the Guardian. It was he who taught the Ultima to extend their lives by a hundred more years simply by shortening their stride as they walked. While not as popular or revered as the other eight, there are significant cults dedicated to him, and many such devotees take pilgrimage across the dangerous King's Haven Pass as a test of faith, a trial in which several perish each year. Interestingly, his worship is also found amongst the Bretons, a carryover from a society that was culturally dominated by the Dereni clan, Morethic Ultima who settled in High Rock and saw Finester as their patron deity and teacher. So the highly stratified and caste structured society can be clearly seen as a reflection of their faith, worship of ancestor gods which embody the values and principles that are deemed the most virtuous and heavenly among the Ultima people. I mentioned earlier the Velothi Exodus, one of the greatest religious schisms of the early Ultima, and this of course involved the Daedra, but a core component of the disagreement most definitely regarded the change in ancestor worship, from all ancestors to only the greatest, and to the purest, 
ancestors of the highest castes. Well, there was another early schism that resulted because of this cultural shift, but one that did not involve Veloth and his triangled truth revelation. Instead, this other schism was more so a preservation of the old ways, kept by the order of the Sigic monks. In the early days of Somerset's settlement, a group of Oldmer, elder dissidents, moved to the Isle of Arteum in order to maintain the old ways of complex ancestor worship and spirituality. They are incredibly powerful powerful mages who recruit new members by a complex, ritualized method not understood by the common people. They believe that the spiritual world is always watching Nern, and they believe all spirits are ancestors of the living. Even the Daedra and Aedra they believe are nothing more than exceptional spirits who gained power in the afterlife. In the book, The Old Ways, the sage Teherite is quoted saying, In Mundus, Conflict and disparity are what bring change, and change is the most sacred of the eleven forces. Change is the force without focus or origin. It is the duty of the disciplined Sigic, enlightened one, to dilute the change where it brings greed, gluttony, sloth, ignorance, prejudice, cruelty, and to encourage change where it brings excellence, beauty, happiness, and enlightenment. As such, the faithful council has but one master his mind. If the man the Sigic counsels acts wickedly and brings a Ginthir bad change and will otherwise not be counseled, it is the Sigic's duty to counterbalance the Ginthir by any means necessary. Ultimately, the Sigic are autonomous and serve the realm by bringing balance, harnessing the force of change, tilting it towards a better future. However, they have been known to give counsel to, and sometimes even serve, the Lords of Somerset or the Lords of Broader Tamriel. A student of the old ways may indeed ally himself to a lord, but it is a risky relationship. It cannot be stressed enough that the choice be wisely made. Should the lord refuse wise counsel and order the Sigic to perform an act contrary to the teachings of the old ways, there are few available options. The Sigic may obey, albeit unwillingly, and fall prey to the dark forces against which he has devoted his life. The Sigic may abandon his lord, which will bring shame on him and the Isle of Arteum, and so may never be allowed home again, or the Sigic may simply kill himself. The old ways may be hard to understand, no doubt thanks to the reclusive and highly selective nature of the Sigic monks, but they no doubt play a role in the grand scheme of Mundus. Perhaps another time we can make a video and go in more depth on the Sigics, but here in this case, it is important to note that the Sigics are functionally the preservers of ancient Oldma faith before the elites changed the culture and shifted worship to only the greatest ancestors among them. Ultimately, the archetypal elven superiority that we have come to know is rooted primarily in Altmeri culture, and remember that even amongst themselves they adhere to strict castes and demean themselves to their social betters, those descended from the greatest of the Oldma. And it's this rhetoric that has persisted into the modern day, with fluctuations in its application over time, but even now, elven superiority, as informed by their culture and religion, is arguably at a high point, with the Altmeri dominion under the governance of the radical Thalmor. It is important to remember that most of elven theology and culture is built on top of such ideas, evolved and developed to their circumstance, or in direct defiance and response to such dogma in the form of a counterculture, such as the case with the early Kaima, or the Sigics. However, among the elven races, we do have quite the enigma in the Bosma. A complicated history and conflicting myths tell us some interesting things about elven inhabitancy on Tamriel and challenges the Somerset migration theory. Their religion is quite similar in some respects, yet drastically different in others. But that, ladies and gentlemen, is for the next episode in the series of the gods. So do subscribe and hit the notification bell so you are made aware when we do release that video. Thanks so much for watching, like the video, and I will see you when we discuss the gods of the Bosma. My name is Scott from Fudge Muppet, and I'll be back to nerd out with you again next time.